Hello everyone, it's Teddy, and today I wanted to give another casual's perspective on, I guess, so, information has come out. It's been a couple days since they released the announcement for, uh, what's it called? The announcement that they are going to a bracket system, and someone has actually compiled the first four days of stats, and I'm sure Wizards of the Coast is going to do something similar when they make it official, but I just wanted to go over the stats that we have now and talk about where they're going and what I think uh, wizards might do in terms of balance. So, I mean, let's get into it, right? So, you might be looking at this and be like, what does this all mean? I see the numbers. So, the numbers on this side are where they'd be rated. For example, Demonic Tutor is a 4. Uh, at least with the information we had, I guess at this point, five days ago? No. It was the 2nd to the 6th, I believe, is when this survey was done. So, we have three days of new information. Are there going to be less polls as the time goes on? Yeah, but uh, the important thing is not this page. It's actually the brackets by mode. And this right here shows us all of the information that they've gleaned and they've divided everything into categories or their brackets based on the information that we had at as of uh how many days ago i guess three uh and it's pretty good also by the way they included dockside on this list don't worry about it dockside is is a non-factor at the moment but point is this gives us a rough idea of what things might look like now I'd like to say, I have looked at their raw stats and numbers, and their card brackets by average, which they have right here. They go into all the averages and show us all that information. And to be honest, it kind of feels like they just chose a random cutoff point for where they were going to start bracket 3. And I, I, I don't know, it just it felt strange, but... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Either way, it, it doesn't matter. But we'll be talking about the bracket that they've brewed up here. Wizards might be similar, wizards might be different, but they are using the information that was retrieved from the survey put out by wizards. Or, not by wizards, by, by the community. And I assume this is how we're going to kind of create our power ratings, if we still want it to be a community thing, which I'm wholly okay with and I'm having fun with. So... Uh, I want to talk about an outlier. Soul Rain. This is the standard deviation. As you can see, it's incredibly high for Soul Rain. And it was very divisive between 1 and 4. But ultimately, even though 4 had 500 ratings and 1 had 750, it was put in 1. Do I know that this is where it's going to go in the end of the day? I don't know, uh, and I don't think anyone really knows. I don't know if this is Wizards' official list. I don't believe it is, but uh, I, it is. I'm just going to warn everybody now, try and lessen the impact. I think Soul Rain is going to end up in Tier 1. It is not going to be a Tier 4. I cannot imagine Wizards making every pre-con that they've released except for one unviable just to make the community uh, the more hardcore of the community, happier that Mana Crypt is about the Mana Crypt banning. So, moral of the story, where do I think Soul Rain's gonna go based on what Wizards is doing? I think it's gonna go in Tier 1, meaning any deck can play it. Uh, do I think it's really powerful and should be in Tier 4 based on power? Yeah, but whatever. I You know, let's be realistic here. Let, let's think about what Wizards is doing. So now... Let's go back to that Brackets by Mode page. So I just wanted to go over that, uh, what I thought about it and like things that I thought might be a little off. So first things first, Rhystic Study, Demonic Tutor, Vampiric Tutor, Fierce Guardianship. Uh, all makes sense. Mana Drain even. It's the best counter spell without... Uh, well, maybe not the best. I, I think most people would say Fierce Guardianship might be better, but... Uh, Mana Drain is incredibly powerful, and is probably the most played at casual tables. People won't take their Fierce Guardianship, but they'll take Mana Drain. 
And, you know, it, it, it gets the job done. It even gives you some mana back for counterspelling, which is incredibly, you know, efficient. But uh, there's another one that I wanted to point out, including Dockside, but, you know, we're not talking about that. Deflecting Swat, which I forgot to open up on another page. But if you don't know what Deflecting Swat is, it is a red spell that if you have your commander out you can cast it for free and it allows for you to change the target of spell uh, a spell that's being cast so uh for example if something targets your commander you can deflecting swat that swords to plowshares and make it hit uh their commander uh pretty good and you can cast it for free if your commander's out so i thought that was interesting because i remember a big gripe that the CDH community had when Dockside was banned was that red was going to be unviable. And if, uh, you know, Dockside ban is going to affect the playing of, uh, you know, red, I think deflecting SWAT's going to put the final nail in the coffin. So, it, yeah, it, it, it's interesting to think about. But either way, I guess they still have Underworld Breach, but I don't know how much play it's going to get now that they don't have his crazy mana generation. So, uh, other ones that were a little bit surprising at the time, Rhystic Study, I'd like to point out, these are not final, as far as I'm aware, these are just estimations based on the first couple days. Uh, Rhystic Study is the only, like, I don't know, they, I guess I'd call it kind of a stacks -y spell in Tier 4, which I thought was really surprising because uh, Smothering Tithe, which we have right here, Whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two. If the player doesn't, you create a treasure token. Uh, I find that card to be equally oppressive, and it is uh, safely, well, you know, it's the top of tier three, but it's there. It's in tier three. And I, I found that kind of crazy. I guess you can pay to counter it after your upkeep for the mandatory draw, but... I was just surprised to see that, because I, I would think if Rhystic Study's going in the top tier, that Smothering Tithe would end up there too. And, you know, as I said, not the final list, maybe it will end up there. And that, that was really the only one in terms of spells that I thought were a little strong. I, I personally, since Heroic Intervention is one of the strongest spells at our table, uh, I think that it could go to tier 3. I mean, it's the top of bracket 2 on this guy's list. So it's entirely possible if you look at these, like, top 2 and you're like, oh, those spells are strong. Or you look at the top 2 or 3 and you're like, oh, these ones are really strong. Then it's entirely possible when the list is over and more votes have come in that these will all be booted up a tier. And, you know, the bottoms might be booted down a tier. I'd be kind of surprised if, you know, Swan Son was booted down a tier, but... You know, you might see Windfall going down to Tier 1, which would be pretty interesting, because right now the only Tier 1 stuff shown is Commanders. But, yeah, there's the Tier 1 stuff. I imagine, like, Arcane Signet, Cultivate, all, all that stuff. They, they just didn't bother showing it, because there's actually so many Tier 1 things. But one big thing I wanted to point out was the Commanders that are in each bracket. Uh, with currently, at the time of their pull, Yuriko and Urza being the only Tier 4 commanders. Which I found to be really interesting. Because, it, like, I get it. I think that I, in all the games I've seen, Yuriko and Urza are really powerful. And, you know, Urza is annoying. He can be stacksy. Artifacts really play into that. And he can you know, use things like Howling Mine and use things like Winter Orb and make it so it only affects opponents by just tapping them for mana. But, so, yeah, Urza, really annoying. Yuriko, also really sticky, maybe in a weird way because you can just always cast her for two. She's really cheap. And the conclusion that I drew from this was that people really don't like commanders that... Or thought these commanders were the most annoying because not only are they incredibly powerful, but they also only really have one way you can build them. So I was like, because like, you know, if we go down to tier three here, you've got Korvald, you've got Niv-Mizzet, who are both, you know, uh, I, what's the word I'm looking for? They're both like CDH uh, borderline commanders. 
Uh, what else do you have? Prosper doesn't really see CDH play. Crick is, I believe, a CDH kind of borderline commander. Prosper can probably get there too. But yeah, it, it was just interesting to see which ones they chose. And it feels like these, spot, uh, these spots might not be entirely complete. Sorry. Because uh, there are other commanders that I think would fall into the same mold of, you know, you build Yuriko with ninjutsu around that, or ninjas. If maybe ninjas don't have ninjutsu, you still throw them in the deck. And you build Urza around artifacts. That's how you build these two incredibly powerful commanders. But there are commanders like the Ur-Dragon. There are commanders like Edgar. The Ur-Dragon right here, uh, who has eminence as long as he's on the command zone or on the battlefield. Other dragons cost one less to cast. And Edgar, who whenever a vampire is cast, you create a 1-1 one -one black vampire creature. And it doesn't even matter if he's on the battlefield. Both of these, if you look at the deck list too, for vampires, if you can't see that, it's 19,000. Life gain, 8,000. It's very clear Edgar has a way you play him. Uh, it, and it's very same-ish. Like, let's look at Ur-Dragon. Dragon decks, 23,000 for the Ur-Dragon. Treasures, 1,000 is the next highest. So this is obviously only from EDH Rex decks that they've like kind of scooped over. But I think it would be very interesting to, you know, it's entirely possible that the Ur-Dragon and Edgar here could be booped up to the same tier as Yuriko and Urza just on the like idea that they are very similar in concept to Yuriko and Urza where they both have very samey play patterns and are also incredibly powerful. But that's just me theorizing. As a casual player, I'd like to say none of this really affects me too closely. So at the end of the day, does it matter to me if the Ur-Dragon or Urza or Edgar Markov are in Tier 3 or 4? No, because I'm not really playing against these decks anyways. But... I'd like to see, I, I'd i hope that maybe Wizards can kind of try and course correct people's thinking or try and like figure out a reasoning or I don't know, maybe it will just be fully community based and they won't like try and, you know, it might even be better if they don't try and figure out what the community's thinking and they just set, let the community say, hey, if you don't like it, you know, it it was all on you. That, that would be a not terrible approach. And I guess another thing, you know, as I was talking about uh, the, what's it called? What was I think talking about? Oh, yeah, the very samey play style of Yuriko and Urza and then Edgar and the Ur-Dragon. Uh, Atraxa, I thought, was actually unique being towards the top of the list because I know... That Atraxa, I believe, is the most salty commander due to the primary playstyle for Atraxa being Infect, which is has on EDH Rec log 13,000 decks with it. But the thing that made Atraxa interesting, and in my opinion, maybe more of a tier 3 deck viable commander, is that there are other ways to play it. With the Super Friends or Planeswalkers comp, 8,000 decks are being built with that. That's not... You know, it's far off, but it's not 23 to 1. And uh, Phyrexians is another option. Plus 1, plus 1 counters. Proliferate those. Uh, Phyrexians. Uh, you know, 6k and 4k, respectively. They're not too far off from each other. Obviously, if you compare Infect to plus 1, 13k to 4k, they're pretty far off. But, you know, there's not as big jumps between each playstyle. And I found that to be kind of nice. And, in my opinion, what makes... Attracts uh, worthy of this tier 3 spot. It's just more flexible, maybe, is the way to put it. I don't know. But at the end of the day, I, I could completely see Attracts of being moved to bracket 4. You know, you know, it doesn't matter that much. But what I thought was super interesting was it feels like the biggest jump here is the jump between brackets 2 and 3. Which I'm assuming that... This is just like diluting my brain. Because 
realistically, it doesn't matter if all of these commanders are here, if they only play with commanders in these two brackets for the most part. Like, if you bring a... But it feels like there's a... Sorry. It feels like there's a much bigger jump when... If I were to bring my Ur-Dragon against, you know, for example, Gishoth here, uh, Sun's Avatar, it feels like there's a little bit of a power imbalance at the table. But, and, you know, as I've said before, Cranko's in Tier 2 here, Bracket 2, Chatterfang. Uh, Pantalaza is strong out of the pre-con box that it comes in. I heard Bray is a really popular and powerful commander. I've never seen it myself. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of good commanders in Tier 2. But it just feels like the jump will help. Most popular zombie commander, I believe. It just feels like the jump is much bigger from Tier 3 to Tier 2. And that can be most explicitly seen in my opinion, with the brackets, the the normal cards that they ban. Like, for example, Toxic Deluge, Heroic Intervention is incredibly powerful at our table, and probably the most powerful card for how often we see it. Cyclonic Rift we don't see as much, because only one of our friends has it in one deck. But all of these cards seem... Uh, like, the power jumps. Mystic Remora, one of our friends has in one deck, but... Yeah, it's just the power between, like, brackets 2 and 3. I, I honestly think the community did a pretty good job at organizing it. However, I think there are some things that might be being taken into account by, uh, like, for example, if we look at the card stats. Uh, let's go down to Soul Rain, which will be easy to find because of its polarizing standard deviation. Is that on this one? Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah, Soul Rain's at the top. Yeah, so, Soul Rain. I mean, it has such a big standard deviation because I think people are accounting for price. And I think that's fair to a certain extent. Because I think if a card is... Uh, what's it called? It expensive and it gates people from playing it, then you can almost certainly factor that in. Like, for example... Yuriko is, I think, like, listed as, like, a $2.49 card on EDH Rec. I guess I can just... I can't. I could double-check. She'll be in Top Commanders. We'll just check that out now. Yeah, Yuriko, $2.49 on... From Card Kingdom, even lower elsewhere from uh, TCG Player. Ur-Dragon's $24 just for Ur-Dragon. Atrax is $19. And Edgar's 120. So, yeah, uh, I mean, like, in terms of that, I think it would be completely fine if Yuriko was, in sorry, in terms of price, I think Yuriko could get away with being a tier 3 if we're going to factor price more into a point. But I completely understand why she's in tier 4. However, I think... Uh, with the cards that are... St some of the cards that are in Tier 3, these cards could be pushed up. But I, I don't know how they want to sort tiers out. Uh, I don't know what the plan is. I, I guess they're not sorting tiers. They're just going solely off votes, and this is based on averages to figure out where they're placed. But, yeah. So, what are my final thoughts? Looking at this information, I think that... All in all, the ratings for most of these commanders are pretty solid. And it kind of, I kind of get where they ended up. In fact, if you go to the average score here uh, and look here, you'll notice Edgar, which you can't see the commanders below him, but Urza and uh, Yuriko are only 0.2 points above Edgar. So Edgar could have easily ended up in. Tier 4, if it were up to Wizards of the Coast, alongside Joda and the Ur-Dragon, if we're going in terms of average standard deviation score, or average score, and then doing standard deviation. So, this is, this is big, and it feels like the community is, for the most part, very unified in where they want cards. Are there outliers? Yes, because, like, 
For example, using this data, Essica, who has the prismatic bridge on her backside, and that's how most people run her, uh, she has a more wide standard deviation because people were, you know, some people put her in one, some people put her in four because she's a really strong commander. She cheats out lots of mana if you get her out really early. Kenrith is another one because Kenrith can be really easily slotted into uh, general good stuff decks and it's so easy to make a five color good stuff deck using Kenrith. And I feel like, yeah, this deck kind of displays it well. He has an average score of 2.8, so he would end up in the Tier 3. Unless, you know, they do the thing like I was talking about with uh, put, booting up Joda and the Ur Dragon and stuff. Then he would end up in Tier 4 with Crick. But, yeah, overall, I think this, uh, I think information is really interesting to look at regardless of what the results say and I think we can learn something from it and honestly from what this person has gathered I don't know like how they gathered it to be fair I don't know what they did what sorcery but it gives us a good idea of what the list might look like and how we're going to play the format net once the you know, power level list is out, and we'll finally have an official power level list so we can stop using the the stupid made-up what power level is your deck where everyone gets it wrong and underrates their deck. Uh, big takeaways from the video. Think brackets 2 and 3 are going to be... There's going to be people who much prefer to play in 2s and below, like me, and there are going to be people who... Uh, you know, I would say the majority of the community will do threes and below. And then there will be that, you know, tier four strong cards community, which, you know, probably CDH will be more in the tier four. And maybe some casual tables will, maybe higher end casual tables will play with some tier four. But mostly it's looking like the commander, the people are going to be divided into two and below and three and below for the most part and I, I i'm excited to see what the list ends up looking like once they uh close the survey and say we've gathered enough information we have enough opinions and yeah uh, overall it's looking good and can't wait to see what wizards does with this i'm excited and i'll see y'all later bye